Hello and welcome to Blue Ridge, uh, Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. Uh, looks a little kind of different uh, being up here, me being the first time. Uh, Pastor Tim, uh, Brother Tim came up and asked me would I uh, help with the rotation since uh, Bob Tootin became uh, chairman of Deacons and I told him I would love to. And this is a chance for me to grow uh, more with the Lord and, and grow in his word. And uh, for those of you who are listening by uh, either by phone or on the video, uh, my name is Greg Crisp. I've uh, been coming here for several years now and it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, trip, a journey through Christ. And uh, there's bigger and better things coming for Blue Ridge View. Uh, before we start, uh, I'm going to put up a word of prayer and that uh, God will bless uh, the ones that are listening. Uh, if you have troubles and trials that you're going through, maybe something in this word that I'll be teaching tonight will uh, give you light and give you peace and uh, help you conquer what you're going through. So let us pray. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you tonight, Father, just uh, saying thank you for what you have done. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the words to say tonight. It is a powerful lesson, and Lord, I hope there is someone out there that is listening, that is going through some challenges and going through some heartaches, uh, that what I might say tonight will uh, be a light into their path. Uh, if there's one that's just scanning and sees me and knows me and just starts listening and is not saved, uh, may they receive you before it's eternally too late. Because, Father, we are living in the last days before uh, you come and take us home. Be with me. Calm my nerves. Uh, just bless the words as... Uh, they are spoken here tonight, for Christ's sake. Amen. Tonight, we're studying, we're doing a new section in our book uh, that's called All In. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard that quote uh, before. And uh, it's uh, a life of commitment. And uh, Bob done the first one in uh, Christ's commitment to us last uh, Sunday and done an outstanding job. And uh, tonight, we're going to be covering our commitment to Christ. We could stop right here and just have a study on the commitment of Christ, what it is for us to do for Christ. And... There's been a, I've done a lot of studying, a lot of digging deep into the scripture. And I want to open up with some new, a few notes of scripture that uh, kind of brings everything together as far as what scripture says for us to be doing. I'm not going to read the scriptures. I'm just going to tell you where they're at. And what I'm doing is bringing the highlights of the scripture out, uh, going with what the uh, title is. The first one is going to be in Luke chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. It talks about the sower of the seed. And uh, many of you have heard the, uh, this message preached over and over. But the highlight of this is the seed represents the word of God. Uh, the, success, the success of the seed, therefore, it has nothing to do with the seed itself. It, it's God's word doesn't appear to be working in our lives, and I'm talking about myself also. Uh, then we need to check the ground that the seed has landed on. You know, the Bible talks about the seed being on bare ground. Seed comes up, birds takes it away. But we want to be dug deep into God's soil. So when we grow, we grow spiritually. We grow a hundredfold. And this is what this verse is talking about. The next one is going to be John 15, verses 1 through 10. And 
This is Christ talking about being the true vine. And what we got out of this pertaining to the scripture says, removing the heavy and dragging uh, vines off the ground is easy. So God, the gardener, uh, takes them away from the ground by, di by lifting them up. God will therefore seek to make you fruitful by lifting you up, encouraging you and motivating you through his word and through the people of God. And coming to church, you are among brothers and sisters who can, if you're feeling down, if you're going through crisis, God's people can come together and rally around you and pray for you. And that's our commitment to lift people up and to be a part of a growing and a Bible-based church. The second one, is, or excuse me, the third one is going to be Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read that because it, it is a very uh, powerful uh, Message And uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2 it says, and be, not and be not confronted to these words, but be ye therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that what is good and accept acceptable and perfect in the will of God. This is a very powerful, a very strong message. And it is, is to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It means to be complete, totally surrendering our lives to God. And this is part of this lesson is our commitment to God. Verse 2, notice that we, have, we aren't conforming or transforming our minds. Someone else is, and that person is God. He has all of us. And when, and when the world has none, none of us, God does his work in renewing and conforming our minds to bring our thoughts in line with his, with his own so that we think the thoughts of God. How wonderful would that be to fall on your face and pray to God and know that you are one and one with him. And as I studied and got to realizing that this is a very powerful uh, message or, or lesson that it hit home with me also that how can I be more committed to Christ and you know a lot of people say well one thing about Christ one other person says another thing you never did hear the disciples complaining as they were with Christ. You know, they said, okay, 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 you know, this is not for us. You know, let's take a break. We've been on our feet too long. You never did hear that. They were committed to doing what Christ asked them to do. And even when Christ was resurrected into heaven, he gave them a command to go and do his will. And that's one thing that the churches need to, to do is have, have the strong will of people going out into this sinful world and leading people to Christ. Even the saints that have grown cold. This is a way to say, you know, Christ, you know, I'm coming back to you. Forgive me for what I've done. Once you do that, come back to God's house. Be among the family that will help you carry the load, that will pray for you, that will uh, lift you up. And it's, it is so amazing to be around brothers and sisters who will pray for you. 
As we take a look at our first uh, verse, or excuse me, first uh, reading, uh, it's going to come from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. It starts out and says, And they brought young children to him, that he should teach them. And his disciples rebuked those that had brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for to such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them, took them up in his arms, put him in his arms, and blessed them. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus gave us a tangible picture of the commitment and the obedience to him, what it looks like. He had been teaching and healing and brought people, uh, and people brought their children to him so that he could teach and bless them. His disciples didn't like it because, you know, in fact, they rebuked those that brought them. Well, Jesus done a little rebuking of himself as we look in. He says, when you, when you, when you look at this event from the disciples' perspective, their, their rebuke made sense. Jesus was, just, was doing really important things, right? He was teaching, he was healing, he was building the kingdom of God. This was work with an inter internal impact. So Jesus surely wouldn't have time to play with little kids. The disciples weren't the only ones doing some rebuking that, that day. Jesus did too. And this is where he said, Be ye leveled his rebuke squarely at his disciples. He scolded the disciples for rebuking the people. In his rep reprimand, he made two fascinating statements. Number one, he says, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God belongs to the people who are like those little children. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. This statement must have blown the disciples completely away because the, the common assumption was that those who were, in the, who were the most learned, educated, and advanced in the things of God would surely make it unto the kingdom of God. But yet Jesus says, must be like little children to enter into the kingdom of God. For most of us believers, there is a time when we loved our Heavenly Father like that. We came to Him in faith and we loved, lo and we loved nothing in the world more than being with Him, with and pleasing our Heavenly Father. But we grew up, didn't we? We got a little more busy became a little distracted there and might say, what's up God? On our way to doing whatever we do. I've been there. And those who are listening, you've been there and probably going through it still. But there's hope. The heart of Jesus meaning here, unless we come to God like a child, a child who isn't yet caught up in the worries of the world, but simply wants to be with and please his Father, then we can't enter into the kingdom. Entering into the kingdom, God's kingdom, has nothing to do with position, power, education, or society standing. Entrance into his kingdom has everything to do with our postures of our heart. Are we getting up every morning? Lord, thank you for allowing me to see another day. Lord, thank you for the beautiful day that you have given us. Are we doing this? The posture we need is delighted, adoring, 
adoring a posture of a child. I was raised, me and my two brothers, we were raised in a church as we grew up. Uh, we all three took different routes of our life. And I've always continued to be a part of a church that grew a, a child, that nurtured a child. And it's, it, it's a wonderful feeling to know that you're being taught the right words. The second verse, the second uh, verses we're going to have is going to be Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 through 20. And it reads, and, and when he had gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do to, that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not fall, bear false witnesses, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Immediately following the account of the little children, Mark related another event that happens to, happens to us see what actually obedience to Christ looks like. This encounter involved a man who was rich. Uh, other gospel writers uh, also described him as young, uh, Matthew 9.20, a ruler, uh, Luke 8, 18. He was a universal question. What even you, you may have asked at some time, what shall I do or what shall uh, that I may inherit eternal life? This young man was trying to secure his way into heaven by participating good deeds or practicing good deeds I picture him standing next to Jesus and his disciples uh, with his writing pen or in his hand waiting, to, for, waiting for Jesus' profound answer uh, his, he was primed and ready for this I'm getting into heaven to do list Here's what the results. The problem comes when we think we can do good enough to gain the right standings with God. We donate to charities. Uh, we help other uh, organizations, which is great. But that doesn't get us eternal life. What gets us eternal life is being saved by Jesus Christ and having him into our hearts and doing his will, staying in his will, staying and digging deep into his word, that gets us eternal life. We volunteer, we volunteer our resources and energy to organizations. Overall, we are kind and good people, but we're sadly mistaken if we do things in our own versions to get away, to get uh, into heaven, a to-do list. None of these things is bad. Don't get me wrong, but they also aren't what it takes to answer the man's questions. What shall I do that I may in inherit eternal life? Jesus gave the young man a checklist he was seeking making the point that he had already knew what the law prescribed. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie or defraud, honor your parents. Jesus used these particular commandments because they would have been familiar to Jewish man. When it came, when it came to outward behavior, the man had done well, He had done everything that the Ten Commandments had uh, said. 
But Jesus picked out one, two, three, four. He picked out six of them. And the young man, the, young, the rich young guy probably thought to himself, sweet, I've done all these things since I was a kid. I've got this, I'm in. It's true, the man's actions did, did, did demonstrate a certain level of commitment. We, did, we just uh, demonstrate our commitment as we uh, strive for obedience. But this young man was only showing partial commitment. That may sound out of place in the light of uh, man's uh, declaration. All these have I observed from my youth. It says in Mark 20, or 10, 20. But the limits of his obedience were about to be fully exposed. And I like what the uh, student book says. It says Jesus was about to drop a bomb on this man's thinking. Let's look at the next, Mark chapter 10, 21, and 22. This is where God, or Christ, answers the young man's question. Then Jesus, behold, and loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever, whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor. And they shall take, and they have treasures in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. He was sad at this saying. And he went away grieved. For he had great possessions. You know I've heard a lot of people say. You know I'm going to buy my way into heaven. I've got so much money. I'm going to buy my way into heaven. Well I've been to a lot of funerals. That people were rich. And I've never seen a armored car. In a funeral possession. The Bible plainly states we come into this world with nothing. We leave with nothing. Jesus laid a big demand on the young man. He said in essence, that's right, you've done pretty well. There's not, there's lack, but there's lacking one thing you lack. You still love money. And of course the Bible says for the Love for the love of the root of love of money is you know evil. Uh, it's nice to have that money, but the Bible says you can't love God and money. In his parable, Jesus called uh, called us to use what we have wisely for the kingdom. So why did Jesus make such a radical demand for this man? Jesus knew the man loved his possessions more than anything. Okay, there's, this, there's the answer. He, he's putting his uh, money, his treasures before Christ. And Christ knew this. Jesus knew that money sat on the throne of the young man's heart, not God. So Jesus looked past the surface obedience and went straight to one thing the man loved most, and that was his money. Let's not miss out, let's not miss what preceded this radical demand. Then Jesus, beholding, beholding him, loved him. The young man wanted eternal life, and Jesus wanted that for him too also. The young man wanted a rich, full life, and Jesus wanted that for him too. But Jesus loved him and wanted the best for him. But Jesus knew the route to both those desires was in all. Committed to follow him. The young man heard an, the, the young man heard an answer to his question, but it was not the answer he wanted or expected. So basically, the young man was going to try to buy his way into heaven. He was rich. He had money setting it on the throne. But it was the wrong throne. He, and Jesus let him know that. This man had said with his mouth he wanted eternal life. But he was not willing to do the one thing Jesus needed him to do. He loved his money more than he loved Jesus. 
He wanted what Jesus had to offer more than what he wanted, a genuine relationship with a person of Jesus. You know, do we have, do we know what happened after this? It, the Bible doesn't mention, but it, he does say that the man went away grieved. He was disappointed because he had done the things that the Ten Commandments had said, but yet he was not willing to give up the one thing that the earth had, and that was the money that he had. And it's strange to see people who, like I said, are rich. I know several. And, you know, you start talking to them about their money. Oh, I got this. I got this. I got this. I got that. And it's like some of the guys we were talking at work. You can't take it with you when you die. But some people think they can. They've got it in their mindset that when I leave, I'm taking this with me. Or when I get to heaven, I'm going to offer God this money. God don't need your money. He wants your heart. He wants all of you. And this is where the lesson comes in. How can, I mean, how can we be committed to Christ? By giving Christ your all. That's what he wants. He wants all of us. He wants to enter into our heart. He wants us to grow. He wants to dig into his word that he has given us that is the perfect word of God and all of life's answers are in this book we may not like it but it's what God t tells us to do he commands us to do and that's a bitter pill to swallow to some people because they don't want to get rid of their riches and when the Lord comes and they stand in the presence of God, he's going to say, you know, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And that's going to be the hardest words for this person to hear because he's going to be expend, expending his rest of his life in hell. And we know, according to the Bible, that hell expands itself every day. And it's, and one of the questions asked is, is, what obstacles keep some people from totally committing to Christ? After the man walked away, Jesus remarked, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's in Mark chapter 10, verse 25. It can be very difficult to get worldly things like money off the thrones of our hearts. But unless Jesus has first place in our hearts, we can't enter the kingdom of heaven. God wants our hearts, all of our hearts. Not just part, not just, okay, God, you can have this part, I'll take this part. No, it doesn't work that way. God wants all of us. He wants all of us to be all in. How then are we saved? Can we only be saved by first being perfectly committed to Christ with all of our hearts? No. We are saved by grace through faith. Let me say that again. We are saved by grace through faith. We enter the kingdom of God like little children who come to our Heavenly Father desperate for love and presence when we come in and into God's house we want his love to fill our hearts we want to feel his presence when the pastor gets up here and speaks he speaks the words that God tells him to speak yeah it may step on our toes but it's showing something in our hearts that we need to get rid of so we can be fully committed to Christ. The heart of what 
Jesus is, is getting at is that the evidence of our salvation is that we have hearts fully committed to the Holy, the Heavenly Father who loves us so much. The evidence that we trusted Christ and have genuinely received the love of God is what we totally committed in giving Him in return. God gives us grace, gives us mercy. And in return, we give that back to him. Is it hard? Yeah. Because we have Satan who we, Satan who we are battling every day. Does it seem like our prayers go unanswered like the preacher taught, spoke? Maybe we're not praying the right way. You know, we need churches to be back at these altars asking God to fill our hearts so that we can grow as a church as a nation to get back to what this country was founded on and that was the grace of God what are the some what are some of the lasting truths from Mark chapter 10 verse 21 the call to discipleship demands a response. The only way to eternal life includes willingly giving up anything and everything that separates us from the love, from the, from the, from the Lord who alone is the source of eternal life. I love fishing, but I don't put my fishing before the Lord. You know, some people say, let's go fishing on Sundays. No, I'm in God's house on Sunday. A lot of people put their material things before Christ, and that's wrong. Christ should always be number one in everybody's life. You see some tags saying, you know, God is my co-pilot. No, God should be the pilot of your life. Let go of the wheel. Let God drive. See where he takes you. The saddest decision in life is choosing to refuse Christ. That is the biggest statement right here. The saddest decision in life is choosing to refuse Christ. Folks, hell is real. No matter what other denominations say, hell is real. You don't go and burn up. You're tortured forever and ever and ever. And if you're listening by the way of video or however you're listening remember that if you go through this life listening or coming to church listening a, a, a preacher preaching God's word and you walk out that door feeling the same way you came in something's wrong we don't know the day the hour that Christ comes but we do know this, we are living in the last days. He could come before I finish this lesson, which would be wonderful. But when you stand before Christ and he says those words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But they say, Christ, we've prophesied, we've done this in your name, we've done this, we've, we've gave, we've done it's not what Christ is looking for. And when he stand, when you stand and he's got the books open and he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, and you are thrown into a burning hell, it's over. You are tortured. You are burning day in, day out, forever and ever and ever. And people say, you know, how can a loving 
and just God sent someone to hell. He doesn't. He sent his son here to die on an old rugged cross. And on the third day arose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave. His son is the answer to keep from going to hell. Accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Be fully committed to Christ. It's a strong study. I've had to go back several several times and really dig deeper. And you see people saying, you know, well, I'll get saved right before the rapture. Do we know that? You know, I want to be saved. You know, a person, you know, if a person comes to be to be saved, he can get up and walk away knowing that his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So whatever trial or trouble that you are going through in life, and you are a Christian, fall on your face before Christ and pray to Him that He will help you remove this burden and help you go through these troubles of life. If you are an unsaved person, I cannot stress enough how important it is to have Christ to come into your heart to save you from that eternal damnation. And like I said, if you are listening or, or, or see me and know me and not a Christian, please, I beg and plead, get a hold of me, talk to me, or call the church. Talk to the pastor. Talk to a, a, someone, a friend that is a Christian. Be saved before it's eternally too late. God doesn't want nobody to go to hell. He wants everybody to be with Him. But there are people who make choices. And sometimes those choices they make are bad. And being unsaved... That's the road that if you want to keep going down, then, you know, your destiny is already, you know, picked for you when Christ comes. The biggest thing I'm trying to get out is that churches need to be filled with Christians on fire for God. They need to be willing to dig deep into God's Word, to take His Word out from these four walls into this lost and dying world. And that's what our pastor has been preaching on. Is it hard? Yeah. If Satan don't want this. He, he does everything he can to draw you away from being with Christ. He throws obstacles in your way. This is where it gets back to being in his word. Staying in his word. Praying. Asking God to put on, to put this whole armor on that you can defeat Satan and the arrows that he throws at us. Is it hard? Yes. But always remember one thing, that you've got someone standing beside you who's done defeated Satan. We've done read the book of Revelation at the very end. We know what his, his story is going to end like. Blue Ridge View, it is a, a great praying church. A 
man of God who stands on his word and preaches it. And this is what we need. Our nation is falling apart. We have gotten further and further away from Christ. Christians, we need to come back together. Fill the churches like it used to be. With praying, with singing, with shouting. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. Even David rejoiced when the altar was brought back. We need that in our churches. I'm going to close with one question. And this question is a very powerful question. Don't just let me, just don't hear the words that I say. Let this sink deep into your heart. How would you describe a life fully committed to Christ? Let me read that one more time. How would you describe a life fully, wholly committed to Christ? To Christ. It's a tough answer. It's a tough question. Do we have to let go of the things that we love? Do we have to uh, say, you know, okay, God, I'm I'm all yours. I'm all in. Are we willing to do that? Are we saying? Are we are we fully committing our lives to God? And like I said, it's, it's a very hard question. And how you answer this is how committed are you going to be in Christ as days go by? With that, let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just count it a privilege to go through your study of how we can be more committed to you. And Father, we know that being saved and having you wholeheartedly in our heart to let us grow, to, to study your word, to dig deep into your word, and, and let it show us how we can be more committed to you. Yes, it is a hard battle. Satan does not want it. But Father, we know that you are greater and mightier and more powerful than what Satan will ever be. And Lord, if there is one that is listening here by video or by whatever, and that's not saved, May he, may he or she become saved before it's eternally too late. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for saving us. And Father, we just continue to ask for your blessings every day as we go through life. I'll be with the pastor tonight as he brings the message. And Father, we ask all of this in your holy name. Amen.